Now on the left side of the screen you see an ankle strategy, which we talked about in the previous video. But on the right here, this is a hip strategy, and primarily the movement and the control of balance is with the muscles at the hip joint, around the hip girdle. Now, what types of things would elicit a hip strategy? Well, first of all, if the person's base of support is narrow, so their feet are very close together. Recall that in the ankle strategy, the feet were either shoulder width or they could even be a little bit wider apart. But with a small perturbation and a narrow base of support, you're more likely to elicit a hip strategy. One example where this actually occurs without an external perturbation is actually on a balance beam in gymnastics where you have to walk with your feet very close together. Uh, you're not gonna have an ankle strategy with that because the base of support is so narrow. Now the detection of that shift of center of gravity is through the vestibular apparatus, which again is different from the ankle strategy the change in center of gravity there was detected through ankle proprioceptors, whether the ankle was going into more dorsiflexion or into more plantar flexion. Here it's the vestibular apparatus. And also in contrast to the ankle strategy where the muscle activation was distal to proximal, for the hip strategy the muscle activation is going to be proximal to distal. The hip strategy that you see here in the diagram, this is from a posterior directed perturbation and that would cause the center of gravity of the person, particularly around the hips, to shift posteriorly. And that's going to cause the person to need to activate their posterior musculature. The two most important muscle groups here are going to be the paraspinals and the hamstrings. And remember, they activate proximal to distal, so the paraspinals are actually going to activate first, and then the hamstrings. And they're both going to activate first eccentrically to control that shift of center of gravity. So the center of gravity is shifting posteriorly because of the perturbation. So first those muscles will activate eccentrically to slow that movement down to zero so it doesn't just keep going, causing a fall. So it slows it down to zero and then once it's stopped they contract concentrically to then bring the center of gravity back forward and ultimately the person back to their starting position which is there in blue. Here's a hip strategy that's induced by a posterior directed perturbation. So the center of gravity shifts posteriorly, paraspinals and hamstrings contract eccentrically to slow it down, and then concentrically to bring the center of gravity back forward and the person to their original position. You can see here that during this same strategy, the feet are together because in order to induce a hip strategy, the base of support should be narrow, so feet close together. Here's a hip strategy that's induced by an anterior directed perturbation. This is causing the anterior musculature to activate, in particular the abdominals, most importantly the rectus abdominis, and the quadriceps, most importantly the rectus femoris, which is acting as a hip flexor there. Now in general, both of those muscles are activating eccentrically first, again just like with the posterior perturbation, to help slow the movement down, and then once it's stopped, they contract concentrically to help bring the center of gravity back posteriorly and the person to their original position. You can also see here that for this hip strategy versus the one induced by the posterior directed perturbation, we have a smaller movement overall. And that's because this involves hip extension and lumbar extension, uh, two movements that have smaller ranges of motion than their corresponding flexion movements that you actually have in the posterior directed perturbation. And you can see here that, again, the base of support is narrow. If the base of support were wider, assuming a small perturbation, you would more likely induce an ankle strategy than a hip strategy. And then finally, we have hip strategies induced by laterally directed perturbations, where the center of gravity shifts either left or right. And with these, you're going to have mostly ipsilateral lateral musculature that activates, meaning if the center of gravity shifts towards the right, it's going to be mostly muscles on the right side that activate to move the person back to their original position and vice versa. Although, depending where you're looking, you may also have contralateral muscles that activate. So to understand this, we need to take a look at a specific example. So there's a hip strategy. I have paused it. And this was a right directed perturbation because it shifted my center of gravity to my right. Okay. I need to get my center of gravity shifted back to the left so I can be upright, right? So 
In order to do that, I actually need to contract the obliques on my right side. Remember that with the obliques, they cause ipsilateral lateral flexion of the spine. So which direction am I bent right here? Well, relatively speaking, my spine is bent in left lateral flexion. So in order to return to neutral in terms of the spine, I need to get right lateral flexion. So that means I have to contract my right obliques. And then in terms of the right hip, it's in relative adduction. So to return it to neutral, it needs to abduct. I need to contract my hip abductors, gluteus, medius, and minimus. So when we consider the hip abductors and the obliques, it's going to be ipsilateral activation, meaning whichever direction the center of gravity shifts initially, those muscles on that side have to contract to help bring the person back to the starting position. But then if we take a look at my left hip, it's actually in relative abduction. And so for the left hip, it's actually the adductors that are going to need to contract in order to help bring the left hip back to neutral. Okay? And of course, the base of support is still narrow. Now, another thing I want you to notice here is that when I'm shifted to one direction, the contralateral knee bends like that. So when I'm shifted to my left there, the right knee bends a little bit or flexes. When I'm shifted right, the left knee flexes, okay? So there's a reason for this, okay? When I'm shifted toward the right, as you see right here, which foot do you think automatically gets more weight bearing? It's the right foot, okay? Whatever direction I'm shifted toward, that foot has more weight bearing. That's because my weight is shifted off of the other side, off of the left side. That creates an imbalance, and the goal here is to maintain balance. And so the reason the contralateral knee bends or flexes a little bit is to functionally shorten that leg to make it easier to distribute some of the weight onto that foot. If this knee doesn't bend and stays straight, you're actually getting much more weight bearing just on one foot. And as we know, that makes it more difficult to stay on balance. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.